difficulty? No, we're live. Okay, go ahead, Rick. Hello, everyone. Welcome today to the welcome to today's JSM Encore presentation. I'm Rick Peterson from the ASA office. Uh, thanks for staying with us. We had a couple of technical difficulties that we've worked through, and we're ready to start now. Um, JSM Encore presentations are based. We have great JSM invited sessions, and we picked one of the, uh, we pinpointed a couple that are very popular and very well attended, and we decided to offer them again online to give persons who are unable to attend the live presentations an opportunity to take in the session. Uh, the presentation will follow the format of the regular JSM session. There will be four presentations followed by a question discussion period. Uh, send questions using the Say Something field found at the bottom of your screen. Uh, for tweets, please use hashtag JSM2015. Um, today's presentation, the statistics identity crisis, are we really data scientists, is sponsored by the ASA and Simply Statistics. I'd like to now turn things over to the chair and organizer of this session, Jeffrey Leak. Jeffrey, the floor is yours. All right, thanks a lot, Rick. I really appreciate the invitation, and I'm very excited for Simply Statistics to co-sponsor this event. So we have four talks, and since we got a little bit of a delayed start, I thought we'd just get right into it. So I'm going to hand it off first to Alyssa Frazee, who is currently at Stripe, and she's going to talk about Am I a Data Scientist, the Applied Statistics Student's Identity Crisis. Take it away, Alyssa. Great. Thanks. I get to experiment with the screen sharing first. Okay. Okay, so thank you all for coming and listening. Can everyone hear me? Yes, no, good? Sounds good. Yep. We can hear you all great. Right. Fantastic. So um, I'm going to talk to you about the question of whether I'm a data scientist. Um, let's see. I sort of saw in grad school, I felt like a tomato. That was my feeling. So, so the question that a tomato always has is, am I a vegetable or a fruit? And the question that I kept having during graduate school <laughs> um, as I was studying applied statistics was, am I a statistician or am I a data scientist? Um, so I'll try to explain to you guys a little bit more about why I felt this way. Um, I studied math when I was in college, and then I entered my Biostat PhD, but in the middle of my PhD, three years in, I uh, took a summer and went to the Recurse Center, uh, previously known as Hacker School, um, which was a programming retreat, so I basically learned how to code better than I was coding before. Um, I went back to grad school, and then when I finished, I joined Stripe as a machine learning engineer, so just to give you a little bit of background there. Um, a machine learning engineer at Stripe is a person who builds fraud models to detect credit card fraud because Stripe is an online payments processor. So that's why I am today. I build statistical models to predict whether a credit card charge is fraudulent or not. So the question that I still struggle with is, am I a data scientist? Um, so the first thing that I think we should consider when we want to know if we're a data scientist is what question we're actually asking. Um, so what I meant in grad school is, could I get a job offer with the title of data scientist? Um, you know, because so, uh, I was analyzing data, I was using computers, um, but in terms of like, what do I mean by am I a data scientist, that is what I was actually worried about. Um, and if you are like a faculty member or a teacher of students that want to be data scientists, I think the real question is, am I preparing my students to be able to get job offers with the title of data scientist? Um, I think often implicitly stated in this question is, um, could I get an industry job offer with the title of data scientist since, since it, the title is more pervasive there? Um, and I think sometimes this goes beyond just industry into tech industry. Could I get a job in, you know, at one of these tech companies uh, with the title of data scientist? Um, so that's what I meant. Um, and I started thinking about this question by trying to define data science, or at least figure out what it was, and I'm not sure that this is an answered question yet. Um, so, so in my investigations, I first turned to Wikipedia, as we do. Um, so statistics is the study of collection, analysis, interpretation, presentation, and organization of data, and data science is, of course, the extraction of knowledge from large volumes of data, et cetera. Um, these look pretty similar, <laughs> so this was not super helpful. Whoa. Sorry, are we good? We're good. Go ahead. Okay. Um... Uh, so my view of the whole spectrum ended up being something like this. There, there's this line 
you know, one dimension uh, called the data skills spectrum in my head. Um, so uh, on one end of the spectrum is theoretical statistics, and on the other end is software engineering. Um, and I, I sort of will claim that data science falls somewhere in a happy medium between the two. Um, so theoretical statistics is concerned with understanding quantitative data, and software engineering is concerned with building a product that you will ship to someone else who will then use that product. Um, the output of something like theoretical statistics is uh, numerical results or potentially uh, properties of different numerical results. Um, the output of software engineering should be, you know, usable, uh, robust software. Um, and I, again, will, will claim that data science uh, has sort of both of these outputs embedded in it. Um, okay, so back to my identity crisis and my statistician. Um, so, so here is what I was thinking in, when I was in grad school. Well, maybe I'm a statistician. I'm in a grad program called Biostatistics, <laughs> which is a point .4. Um, I can do math, sort of. I know things about martingales and the delta method. And I can explain what a p-value is and interpret linear regression coefficients. All right, great. Maybe I'm really a statistician. Um, but then sort of the identity crisis bit of this is, you know, I, I hadn't proven a theorem since I stopped st uh, taking classes in 2011. <laughs> um, I spent more of my time writing bash scripts than making up new estimators. And I didn't publish any papers in stats journals, which also seemed to be sort of maybe I'm not a statistician. Okay. So maybe I'm more of a data scientist. Um, I can program in languages that are not R. Uh, I can use Git and GitHub. Um, I wrote a few R packages. And one time I made a web app. And also I learned how to make a d3.js graph. Um, it was great. Um, so hooray, maybe I'm a data scientist. But again, I think there are some sort of implicit assumptions in that term that make me question whether that was true. Um, I was not working in industry. I was still um, doing research and and uh, at a university. So maybe this isn't like not a point for my data science cred. Uh, I had never written a SQL query uh, unless you count select star from whatever table. Um, I had seen that data scientists were supposed to understand uh, sort of large-scale ETL pipelines like Hadoop, Spark, and AWS, um, but my understanding of those tools was vague at best and none at worst. <laughs> uh, and I had never written code that had actually been shipped to a paying customer, so these things uh, sort of gave me points against data science. So I was confused. That, that is the main <laughs> reaction I had to these things. Um, so my solution to my confusion was I will listen to what experts in our field say. And my main perspective on what uh, statisticians' reactions to the term data science was were sort of fell into three main groups. Uh, camp number one was the, the people that think that data science is just a rebranding of applied statistics. Um, there was a second camp that sort of said that statistics and data science are related, but not the same thing. And there was a third camp, which actually n almost no statisticians fall into this camp, but more uh, people on the software engineering side tend to think that statistics is irrelevant to data science sometimes. This left me uh, still confused. So uh, first things first, I had to uh, sort of come out of my confusion by thinking about whether I actually <laughs> wanted to be a data scientist or not, because if I didn't, it didn't really matter. Um, so, and the, the second question I have is, does it matter what I call myself if I know what I want to do? Um, so my, my solution to those things were, it, it matters what you call yourself or whether you think of yourself as a data scientist. If you are looking for a job, or if you are hiring people to do work for you, um, you should know what that term means and know how you want to identify. Um, so I, I was on the job market, so I decided to, to go down the road. So if, in your case, if you decide that it matters whether or not you're a data scientist, here, here is where I will share my opinions on what differentiates a data scientist from an applied statistician. Um, so the first point that I made at the JSM session was intentionality about programming. So 
my sort of thesis for this slide is that data scientists spend time thinking primarily about principles of software engineering, which include you know, this somewhat long list of bullet points, um, something like thinking about how fast your code runs, learning how to use version control systems like Git, um, writing clean code, documenting your code, and making sure that other people can run your code. Um, doing things like unit testing and systematic debugging um, and giving and receiving code review. These are things that software engineers think about that, that statisticians who do not um, you know, write reusable software don't think about. Um, so interestingly, at JSM, this slide was tweeted a bunch, and that a lot of the response to this slide was, I disagree that this defines a data scientist, this defines a software engineer. And uh, I will say to that point that data scientists do not spend all of their time thinking primarily about this, um, but they do spend at least some time working on these things. They do, you know, I would contend that if you spend all of your time thinking about these things, then yes, you are a software engineer. <laughs> um, but data scientists at least have to think about this some of the time, which I think distinguishes them from applied statisticians. Um, a second characteristic that I think you find in data scientists more than statisticians is an interest in a schleppy but practical project. Um, so, you know, instead of developing a method or developing an estimator, the schleppy but practical project is figuring out how do I get the data I need to measure the thing that I am trying to measure. And sometimes this basically involves writing scripts and code and data processing tools. That's okay, too. Um, one schleppy but practical project that I did basically was a combination of existing tools and methods. Uh, and it combined them in ways that they had not yet been combined before, but it did not actually introduce anything new or a novel statistical technique. Um, was that a statistician's contribution or maybe just a data science contribution? Um, Let's see, another characteristic of a, like a practical project that maybe would not have novel publishable value but would actually work and give you results is just finding a simple solution um, that works in practice and tells you what you need to know. Um, I think these kinds of projects tend not to be as present in academic statistics, but, but I think would be defining projects in a data science curriculum or career. And then, finally, I sort of alluded to this before, um, there's a focus on concrete decision making in data science. Um, it's less about estimation and more about what action should be taken. So I realize there, there are branches of statistics that focus on this, you know, like decision science. Um, but I will say, like, in my job, uh, you know, there is the estimation of what is the probability that this credit card charge is fraudulent, but at the end of the day, like, I need to decide, or my team needs to decide, or my, me my method needs to decide, should I let this charge go through our system, or should I decline it for fraud? Um, I have to make that decision and cannot, like, saying there's too much uncertainty to make the decision is not an option. Um, so I think sometimes in statistics, um, quantifying the uncertainty is more important than the decision, but in data science, uh, making the decision, I think, is, is sort of the main goal. Um, OK, so those were some of the defining characteristics that I see in data science. Now back to the three camps that I have sort of observed. Um, so my perspective, now that I've been working as a data scientist, is that data science is not just a rebranding of applied statistics. And I think that was potentially clear from the differences that I talked about before. Um, because of this intentional intentionality about programming and the fact that the, my day-to-day -day work as a data scientist now is different than my day-to-day -day work was when I was doing applied statistics in graduate school. So um, in July, so right before I gave this talk at JSM, um, a couple of things that I did at my job were um, I wrote Ruby code that interacts with our um, sort of um, user-facing public uh, strike API, so I wrote code that actually declines or uh, accepts credit card charges. Um, I wrote Scala code that sort of transforms the data that we collect from that API into something that I can actually analyze. I wrote CoffeeScript to visualize data, and I did write some Python, which was very fun and felt super familiar after all of those other things. Um, I fought with Maven, a Scala build tool, which I had never done as a statistician. Um, I, backfill I backfilled some of our SQL databases. I um, launched a sort of three-day investigation as to why our cluster boxes that actually do the credit card charge scoring were overworked. Um, I learned how to be on-call, so if we stopped uh, 
analyzing credit card charges for fraud at 3 a.m. I can fix Stripe. <laughs> um, I taught others how to use our SQL databases and how to write SQL queries. And I also did some statistics, so I helped run some experiments um, that sort of helped us make decisions about what we should, um, what kind of features we should keep and not keep. So this to me feels different than, you know, in graduate school, like last month I did an analysis, last month I wrote a paper, uh, last month I had collaborator meetings. Um, I'd like to address camp three, the people that say that statistics is irrelevant to data science. Um, this is the picture that I showed at JSM. Uh, if you try to make decisions without knowing how uncertain you are about them, you're going to have a bad time. Um, if you use estimators without knowing their properties, you're also going to have a bad time. So I will give you the side eye if you tell me that statistics is irrelevant to data science, and it's not. So. As you may have predicted by now, uh, my sort of view, um, now that I've been in data science for a few months, <laughs> is that statistics and data science are uh, overlapping. Neither is a subset of the other, and both have valuable things to offer to the problems that we solve. Um, so in terms of the identity crisis, um, if you decide that being a data scientist is important, or if you want a data science job, um, program intentionally and do this. But I also think it's it's hard, like, if that's not interesting, like, statistics is still good and interesting in its own right. So do this if you want to do this, um, or don't. This is like my, my sort of last point at JSM, is that statistics is hugely important and relevant in its own right. Um, so that is the last slide that I have. I, I showed the first four links at my JSM talk, and they are available on the slides that I posted for that. Um, and actually, Jenny, who you, who you will hear from later, um, sent me this Medium article uh, about hiring unicorns. She emailed it to me a couple days ago, and it was great. There was a whole section in the middle about um, how software engineering is important, but data scientists are not software engineers, and I thought that really, like, uh, resonated with me as uh, as someone who likes programming but is potentially not a software engineer. So that is what I have now, and I'm going to put the, my face back on the Hangout. So I think I have some time for questions. All right, uh, great. Right. Uh, thanks, great. Alyssa. Uh, thanks, Alyssa. Oh, we got to wait till you mute. I'm so muting. We, yeah, can you mute? So okay. Great. So thank you very much for the talk. I think for the moment we're going to move through each of the talks and then we'll maybe do some questions at the end because we got kind of a late start. I want to make sure everybody gets to talk. So um, the next speaker is going to be Chris Valinsky from AT&T. And he's going to be talking about how industry views data science education and statistics departments. So I'm going to let Chris take it away. OK. Uh, can you verify that you can hear me, Jeff? Yep, we can hear you great. OK, great. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, I think it's going to be. A, I think it, you're going to really enjoy the session. Um, thanks, Alyssa, for that that perspective. That was great. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a different perspective. So I'm Chris Belinsky. I work for AT and T. Um, I lead a group called Big Data Research here, where we um, hire um, statisticians slash data scientists. I'm going to talk a little bit about my perspective of being in an industrial research lab, and how we see people coming out of grad school, um, you know, with these types of jobs. But I think um, probably the best way to do that for me is to make it a little bit personal and talk about you know my journey. So back in in the nineteen uh, <laughs> late nineteen nineties, uh, when I was still in grad school, um, I got a summer internship um, here at AT and T, uh, and I worked for this guy who some of you out there may know. This is Daryl Pregabon. He was an early pioneer in what they called at the time KDD. Um, which then became known as data mining and now is kind of called data science, although those things are all a little bit different. Um, Daryl was my mentor here at AT&T, and I came here after my fourth year of grad school. And I remember sitting in, um, sitting in his office the first day of my um, internship, and he sat me down and he said, hey, Chris, you know, um, about 90% or so of the stuff you learn in grad school is irrelevant here this summer when you're working for us. And the reason he said that was because he says, we're working on real world problems with large data sets. A lot of the things you're learning about don't scale. Um, sometimes we just have to come up with methods that are ad hoc to solve a business problem and don't necessarily have a lot of theory behind it. Um, but we're using good statistical practices and um, intuition to solve these problems. And I had this summer. I spent the summer there, and it was a really great summer. It was so great that it worked its way into a job. And you know, I've been here at AT&T for 18 years. 
Um, and it was it was just really interesting to get that perspective on, you know, not necessarily using that whole uh, bunch of stuff I had learned in grad school, but really, you know, being applied and using whatever was in my toolbox to to solve a problem. But it was kind of um, it was kind of off-putting to think that you know those four years of grad school weren't relevant um, in the in the real world, so to speak. So um, so that that kind of um, you know made me wonder. And I think that the today's data scientists coming out of um, statistics um, departments maybe are having the same kind of incongruity about what they're learning versus what they're seeing out there um, in the real world. So um, you know, fast forward 15 years, and I'm here at AT and T, and I'm you know, interviewing people like that coming out of grad school and trying to assess whether they can help me solve the real world problems that I'm dealing with today. And I think that the, the, um, the one thing we really look for, the real skill that we look for, more important than anything else, is um, problem solving, right? Being able to formulate questions and solve problems. And so I've interviewed a lot of people over the years. Um, it's hard to count how many interviewed a lot of people and you know originally I approached interviews uh, for people and I asked them about their technical skills or about their research and we'd have a good back and forth and after a while I realized what I really wanted to get at was this idea of problem solving. How do people formulate questions and how do they solve problems? And so um, recently uh, when people have an interview I ask a single question. I say that I think tries to get at the, the point of this problem solving uh, assessing whether or not they have the skill. The question I ask is something along the lines of, imagine you worked for a large hypothetical uh, large telecommunications company who has 100 million mobile devices out there in the US. What questions would you ask? What types of things do you think you could learn from that and how would you go about doing it? And it might be an unfair question because people aren't typically familiar with our industry, but people know cell phones enough to try and formulate something. And I'll give you an example of a good answer and a bad answer that I've come across in those, those types of interviews. The good type of answer is someone who kind of sits back and thinks, well, okay, what would a uh, mobile carrier be interested in? Okay, well, you guys probably want to eliminate dropped calls. So let me think about what data I could collect that would help me understand that. So they might ask me a question like, um, do we have information on uh, the location of where the dropped call happens? And I'd say, oh, yeah, well, we have the cell tower where the call was dropped. And um, then they might say, oh, okay, so maybe what I would do is I collect a bunch of data about dropped calls um, and maybe the non-dropped calls, maybe build a supervised learning model, maybe we could talk about the type of model, um, maybe they'd be, they'd key on to the fact that there could be a spatial element to the modeling they could do. And so we talk a little bit about the problem, a little bit about the business need, and then we could even drill down into technical details of the supervised learning or spatial uh, model that they'd be interested in fitting. And so literally a half hour, 45 minutes could pass discussing this one question, and I could see that they were formulating a question and figuring out a way to solve it and even talking about technical details. So that's a good example. A bad example would be somebody who says, well, let's see, my research was on this particular type of time series model, and let me think about what data I could collect in your network that might, I might be able to apply my model to. And I've actually had people who have answered like this, and they might as well have come into my office and said, I have a hammer and I'm looking for a nail. And that's really not the way we want people to think, and it's not the way we should train people. Anyway, so after a couple of years of, of giving this type of interview, I realized a pattern. Um, we interview people from lots of different fields, st statisticians, as well as people coming out with computer science or machine learning degrees. And I often found that, you know, to generalize a bit too much, the people coming out of statistics programs were often the ones who were giving the bad type answers. People coming out of other programs, more often than not, were giving the good type answers that the people who were trained in statistics academic departments often were really channel focused on the one thing that they did for their PhD. And that's understandable because to get a PhD you have to really drill down into something really carefully. But um, it was really interesting to see that they just weren't that good at thinking outside the box outside of their, um, outside of their expertise. And um, 
you know, I've thought a lot about why that is because I come from the field, I come from a statistics background, so I kind of want the statisticians to succeed. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with the culture of the, the disciplines themselves. In statistics, we really we focus on the mathematics of it. And we really want people to to you know do things rigorously, and so a good statistics graduate um, applicant is going to have maybe a JASA paper or maybe one or two really good papers and a couple of things they've submitted. Whereas a good computer science PhD is coming out with typically seven or eight papers. Um, presented at conferences, peer-reviewed at conferences, shortish papers about 10 pages long over a wide array of different topics, some theoretical, some applied. And I think that that culture in computer science where they're um, graded on uh, conference papers, whereas in statistics and, say, mathematics were graded on journal papers, it it kind of encourages a little bit more breadth and a little bit more understanding of various different topics and allows them to kind of pursue problems from different angles and maybe think outside the box more. So that's a big generalization, but it's something that I've noticed um, in, in general. So again, I'm rooting for the statistician, so I kind of want to, kind of went back and thought about, well, what is it about statistics and the way we train people that kind of give them a disadvantage in the types of jobs that I'm looking for, you know, when I'm interviewing. So I thought about my own statistics education, and here's a picture of my old textbook, Freund and Walpole, which, you know, as I leaf through it, you know, it's got the standard stuff in it. It's got, you know, estimation and probability and confidence intervals. Um, the examples are from engineering and maybe uh, um, opinion polling and a lot of government examples, census examples. This is a reflection of the time when, st when statistics education matured. Um, but obviously it's not kind of relevant to today and we really need to bring forth the interesting large data examples that are, that are relevant. I know some of those textbooks um, do exist now. But I thought about, you know, this, it's not, it's, you know, there's this comment about statistics being the sexy discipline um, of the next 10 years, and that comment was made almost 10 years ago, so I guess, you know, we can look around at our colleagues and see if that's, that's true nowadays. But, um, you know, I, I, I was thinking about how we can take it from this kind of dry to make it more, I don't know how to make it sexy, but maybe to make it more relevant to the types of jobs that are out there today. Not all the jobs, but the types of jobs in startups and in applied areas that I think a lot of the graduate students of today are, are interested in. And so I, I, this list is partially thanks to Michael Rappa, who's the director of the Institute for Advanced Analytics at NCSU, um, who we've worked with here at AT&T. Um, and I'll just go through a list of things that I think are really relevant to be, to be training our students in. I think we've got to expose students to messy data problems and data cleaning methods. We've all heard that anecdote about whether it's 70, 80, or 90 percent of our time that goes into cleaning data and that data munging aspect. Um, that's real, and that's true, and that's how the real world works. And so if we want to prepare people to be applied statisticians, we've got to train them on messy data problems and data cleaning methods. Um, giving students the opportunity to work in teams is really crucial. To be able to get different perspectives of people who approach problems in different ways really helps, um, I think, the students be able to develop that, that um, thinking outside the box type of, uh, types of types of thinking and working in teams, which is very important um, out in the real world. Um, giving teams opportunity to present their work. Um, we often see candidates who come in who just aren't really good at the communication aspect of what they're doing, great technically but not able to communicate. And that's a really important skill that I think is underemphasized. Um, uh, also, data visualization methods, which are good for two things. Data visualization methods are important for the data scientist to explore a data set and maybe get alerted to things that would, that would trigger a more in-depth study. Um, data visualization also helps in the communication, being able to communicate the results of your, your analysis, and that's really important. And solving problems A to Z. I'll let, let people work in teams, collect their own data, clean it, munge it, analyze it, do good analysis, do the testing, do the evaluation, and communicate it. From start to finish, try and solve a business problem with a data set. These are the types of things we look at, those problem-solving um, techniques. So the next question I kind of thought about myself is, well, you know, the things I talked about on the last, the last slide, do you really need a statistics PhD to, to do all that stuff? Right? I mean, statistics PhD is a pretty uh, rigorous, it's a rigorous field, and it's got a lot of depth to it. 
um, do we need all the stuff we learn to be relevant in these fields? And we've worked, um, I've worked with two organizations that are training people to be data scientists at the type of organizations you see on this slide. One is Insight Data Science, which is um, a group in both in the Bay Area and the New York area where they take PhDs, but they take PhDs from other, typically from other fields. They take statisticians also. But hard science fields like you know, biology and chemistry and physics and other, other things. And they bring them in and they give them a six-week crash course in data science. And then they are, it turns out that they are um, getting jobs at places like this. Also, the Institute for Advanced Analytics in NC State has more of a traditional um, data science master's degree where they train people for a year, but those people don't necessarily come in with a statistics PhD, maybe other PhDs. I think PhD, the, getting a PhD is important because it does show that somebody has the um, kind of the wherewithal to tackle a really hard problem from start to finish. But, you know, it's not statistics PhDs who are getting jobs at these places that are really, um, I think, traditionally the types of jobs that statisticians would get. These are big data problems that these companies have. They're asking analytic questions. They want to solve them with data. They want to try and understand the variance and things like that. But it's not statisticians who are getting these jobs. So I think you know, we, we do need to try and help to train our, our, our students to be um, relevant for these, uh, these types of positions. And so um, you know, again, thinking a little bit more about it, I, I really do believe that the statistics discipline brings a lot to these fields and that it should be statisticians getting this job, these jobs because of the way we think about things and approach problems, we just might not be emphasizing quite the right things. And you know, I'd like to talk a little about what it is that the statistics discipline brings to these problems that maybe other fields don't. And I think number one in my mind is what I'll call the language of uncertainty and error. We think about things from the very beginning of our training in terms of what is the uncertainty and what is the error. One way I like to put that is we don't think about how right our answers are, we think about how wrong our answers are. We don't provide an estimate or an answer without thinking about what is the variance and what is the error. And I think that's a really important way to look at problems. The mechanics and language of probability helps us to quantify what that error is. And you know, we've thought a lot as a discipline about these things like uncertainty and probability. Um, you know, what, is the pro what does a hypothesis mean? What is the probability that a hypothesis is correct? Oh, no, we don't think about that way. If we assume the hypothesis is correct, what's the probability that we see the data? You know, this, this really structured way of thinking about problems in terms of how they can go wrong or how the data might not be completely reflective of the actual underlying uh, phenomenon, that's really important. I think that's a really powerful way to look at problems because it brings a natural skepticism to the problems that I, I, I find really important. Um, again, we're taught from very beginning to look at articles in the newspaper that have statistics or numbers in them and can we poke holes in it. But be skeptical of everything you read. Every number you see, the data that you collect, it's not right. It's always got some error. The data you see is just a, you know, it's just a sampling from some distribution. Um, approaching these problems and approaching data, knowing that the data is just one instance of what you might see and is probably wrong in some sense, um, is really powerful. Um, an anecdote I have, I have there is uh, I was, in my early career, I was brought on to a project where, um, where the, a team, a business unit had worked on a fraud or um, a churn problem, and they brought me on because they had done some modeling and they wanted to bring a statistician on to kind of validate the work that had been done. Um, and so I joined a call and I introduced myself. I'm Chris Polinsky. I'm a statistician, and I was asked to kind of come on to take a look at the work that you guys are doing. And someone on the call went, oh, statistician. My goodness, you guys are like the lawyers. Every time you get on a call, you're telling us what we can't do. You're telling us what we're doing is wrong, we sampled wrong, there's this bias, there's that bias. Um, you know, and that's true. In some sense, we do like to tell people when they're doing things wrong, or at least we try and tell people when it comes to data collection, you know, how to do, you know, what, what proper, um, what the, well, you know, what the best practices are. But um, you know, I think it, I like to think of it more instead of being the lawyers as we are providing that natural skepticism that really allows um, problems to be done in a proper way. 
And I think that, you know, I think that brings a lot of value to teams. And I think that way of looking at the problem um, through uncertainty and with skepticism is very important. And then in terms of the tools that we have in statistics, I'll mention a few that I think, you know, maybe are un underemphasized in our curricula. Empirical methods like, like Monte Carlo tests and bootstrap. Hey, you know, like I mentioned that a lot of the things we do are sometimes ad hoc. You know, you've got to put together some kind of scoring metric, even if you can't fit a, a formal model because you've got too much data or the method you want to use doesn't scale up. Well, if you want to learn properties about that metric, you know, you can bootstrap it. I think these are really important tools. Exploratory data analysis techniques when you're confronted with a large data set, messy one based on what real people are doing in the real world, um, you've got to spend a lot of time on EDA and really understand what are the, what are the best practices and how to do it well and how to do visualization. Um, and non-parametrics are, are great also because, you, you know, you don't always necessarily know what the um, distribution is or you don't want to make assumptions. And I think um, I find non-parametrics very, very important and very, very valuable. And these things are all important for data big and small. So we all hear about big data. Um, you know, I think we should be focusing on methods that work well for data of data sets of all sizes. And so um, just to wrap up, you know, uh, when I go around and I give talks at universities, I'm often approached by um, grad students who say, hey, how can I help prepare to get one of those cool jobs at Google or Facebook or AT&T or one of these places? And my answer um, is really fill your toolbox. So I think it's really important um, to have one of these applied jobs. You've just got to have a wide array of methods of dealing with data and of analyzing data. I mean, if you come out of a, of a statistics um, PhD program and you want, you know, one of these data scientist type jobs, you've got to know things like support vector machines. You've got to know what a neural net is. You've got to be able to fit a random forest. And these things aren't necessarily um, emphasized strongly in all, in all curricula. And I think that, you know, if we want to train our uh, students to have these types of jobs that I think statisticians could really bring a lot to, We've got to just, you know, fill their toolboxes with as much methods as possible and, and send them out on the world. So with that, I think that's the end of my presentation. Thank you all. I'm going to um, send it back to Jeff. Great. All right. Thank you very much, Chris. That was a great presentation. Uh, really enjoyed it. It was a nice perspective along with Alyssa's presentation uh, about the uh, approach to being a data scientist in industry. We're going to change a, uh, the topic just a little bit, and uh, Lance Waller, as I described it at the JSM se session, he's going to explain how I can keep my job. He's going to talk about evaluating data science contributions in teaching and research, especially from the perspective of uh, academic folks. All right, so I'll let Lance take it away. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and so as Jeff said, my name's Lance Waller. I'm the department chair in biostatistics and bioinformatics at the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. And um, recently, one of our alumna asked me recommendations of students who might be good for a job. And she said, I think I'm looking for a unicorn. So I'm not to steal Jenny's thunder, but I like the link about unicorn. So I hacked my business card. And if you see, the third line now says unicorn trainer on it. Um, this is the only one, so don't, I'm not sharing. Let me switch over to my presentation. Is that showing? Can anybody give me a thumbs up? Everybody. Yeah, it seems to be about to okay. come up. Super. There we go. It's up. All right. So I want to talk about evaluating data science contributions in teaching and research. Just some background at the 2014 Joint Statistical Meetings. There's a chairs workshop where all the department chairs get together and talk about their problem faculty and, I mean, share ideas about running departments. And um, Jeff came and presented the ideas of, of data science, and during the discussion, someone said, well, how do we evaluate these things for promotion and tenure, you know, if they're writing code and if they're developing complicated data sets or they have a blog? And uh, I raised my hand and said, well, it's just a matter of putting it together. You just have to have evidence for it. So Jeff called me out on it and asked me to be part of this last year at, 20, at 2015. So I did some searching, and a couple weeks before JSM, I thought, I better see if there's anything new. And... Um, got on Google and searched for the phrase data science in quotes, tenure and promotion, and the, and the top hit was from Amstad.org. And I thought, well, that's fantastic. There's probably something in uh, Amstad News or American Statistician on this, and that'll really, this, my talk will be really great because it'll link into that. So I clicked on the link, and it, it went to, the, to my abstract for this session. And so even though I felt like I didn't know anything, apparently I knew more than a lot of people. 
Um, so I continue to read, and I'll go through some of my experiences here. But again, my perspective as a department chair. So I'm going to outline, you know, my role and your role. Um, I want you to get promoted. You want to get promoted, and how the tenure and promotion process typically works in an academic setting. Um, the evidence we use for promotion is your dossier, which is a you know big set of things that includes your research, your CV, about your teaching, about your survey. And I'm going to talk about the standards of evidence that are in typical in an academic setting. And then how do data science and teaching reach, uh, fit into this? And, and how do you document success? And, and then we'll wrap it up. So I always wanted to be cool, so I thought maybe astronaut or rock star. Um, but those, that's not what really happened. I really turned into a biostatistics professor and then became department chair. And as chair, I have uh, job duties that involve hiring faculty, mentoring them to get them promoted. Uh, the promotion and tenure step is a one step of the process of a faculty's career, but it, you know it's important. And my goal is I want to know, I want to make the best case I can for everybody in their promotion. So I want a slam dunk promotion from my department as it goes through the School of Public Health and on through the university every time. And then the question is, what about data science? Now you, you're much younger than I am, and you're cool, and you're doing a lot of data science stuff, and you're generating scholarly productivity and scholarly products in, you know, research, teaching, service related to data science, which is all new and out of the box, and you want to be promoted. You don't want to have to sweat it out at the end. Um, so the steps in the promotion process in academia are kind of pre-Copernican, like, like there's, there's you at the bottom, uh, then it goes to your department, and then your department chair reviews what the department says. We pass it on to the promotion and tenure committee. They review that again. Then the dean looks at it. And then an advisor committee or committees at different universities. Then the president. And then the trustees or regents or whatever the top level of admin in the administrative sphere is uh, will finally approve or deny your promotion. So every step of the way, different groups of people are reading your material. And so it's really important if you're in a tenure track position or in a research track position to know the rules associated with promotion. What documentation is required? What's the process? You need to know who's going to be evaluating you because as you go up those spheres, they come from different fields. They might be uh, other natural sciences. They might be social sciences. You know, the further they go up, the less insular they are and the less you become a caricature of a, of a field than you know, trying to represent a, a subset of a field. Um, and you need to realize what represents quality to people as you move further and further out. I find interdisciplinary work or interdisciplinary evaluation is often like moving from one country to another. And the currency changes and the kind of just rules of thumb change where in um, academia when you move from, say, Statistics to epidemiology doesn't seem like a big step, but you know what's cool has changed. The kind of problems are considered that what you should worry about in every paper, what represents a good journal, what's a good place to present. Those things are just sort of pieces we carry with us in our disciplines that we don't think about, but they're hard to translate across. So what documentation is required for you to turn in? What has to be in your, your dossier? What's expected? What do they want to vote on? What do they tend to look for when they're looking at four or five um, dossiers at once? And then what's allowed? And I say allowed because there are certain minimum requirements, say, for external letters, but sometimes you're allowed to include extra letters at some universities. In some universities, there's a very fixed limit of the number of evaluation letters. Uh, at Emory, for instance, we will sometimes include an extra letter from some, some long-term collaborator that gives some specific insight. It's not required, but it's allowed. I know at other universities, an extra letter is not. So it's really important, this last bit, to discuss your promotion process with your chair, with the representative from your department on the promotion and tenure committee. They can tell you how the system generally works. Um, they can tell you the kind of things that, the kind of gaps that um, the tenure and promotion committee gets hung up on when a dossier doesn't have good documentation of this. What are they concerned about? You should talk to your colleague in your department who just went through the process. What was their experience? Um, and you should talk to your dean. Um, I also bring in this as a little bit of a tangent, but in 1990, Ernest Boyer of the Carnegie Foundation wrote a report called Scholarship Reconsidered, Priorities for the Professorate. Um, it's available on Amazon. There's a lot of online versions of it. It's widely cited and known by um, the higher education community. So what's so important? What Boyer said was there are multiple types of academic scholarship. Um, the scholarship of discovery is what we typically think of. You're a statistician. What new statistics did you do? 
we've already heard from the previous two speakers, data science is not just statistics. Data science is not just computer science. It's not just software engineering. So if I'm trying to do discovery in software engineering and it looks like statistics, the software engineers aren't impressed. The scholarship of integration is a place where you're bringing together two fields that have kind of worked in parallel or entirely separately before. Scholarship of application is bringing them together to do something. Um, and the scholarship of teaching and learning is not just teaching well, it's understanding more about how teaching and learning work. Lance, you still there? It's the middle too hard with integration and application. And it, provide, it provides a broader context than just scholarship within your own field when you're putting together your dossier. Um, it's also important to bring this up because deans talk about this all the time, provosts talk about it, presidents talk about it. They all say, scholarship reconsidered. We want to create a university where we recognize the broad range of scholarship. And I think it's worth pointing out that data science is one of these things that bridges across all of them. Now, when you put your dossier together, there's, there's three kind of key elements. There may be others, but these are always in there. One is a personal statement that you write about yourself in terms of what you do in terms of teaching, research, and service. The second is a very detailed CV highlighting your accomplishments, and it's usually broken out in those three areas again. And the third one are external letters from experts in the field talking about you, your work, and your standing. So the personal statement, you want to tell your story and put your work in context. I thought Alyssa's presentation is a good example that explains where you're coming from, what you've picked up along the way, what makes you unique, what defines your success. So you want to highlight the things you've been able to do in the past, and then jumping to the end of this slide, you want to say where you're going next. Nobody wants to get to promote the person who's peaked and decided they're not doing anymore. So you want to highlight on what your focus is, how you've been recognized for it, what's unique about you, and what motivates you for the next step. Now your CV and these blocking things out, the typical measures of success, and we'll look at these in more detail, are things like research success is usually measured by peer-reviewed publications, and that's even itself um, a little tricky and we'll talk about it. Competitive grant funding, being invited to speak at conferences or give seminars. You've been recognized by your peers as someone who's successful. Teaching success will be your performance in teaching courses, which, might, which typically includes at least summaries of course evaluations. It may include peer evaluation. Um, also, what new ideas have you put in? Have you tried new things in the classroom? Did you develop new courses? Um, did they work? Did you do some research, even some basic um, summaries, descriptives of how well your new ideas work. And then in service, what projects have you helped people complete? Uh, typically these may come in in collaborative publications for statisticians and biostatisticians. And then what one of my colleagues calls are strong collaborations. These are people you work with over a long period of time so you really understand the scientific questions driving the analysis you're doing. Now the letters of support are important. Uh, typically you will provide some names and your chair will need to provide some other names. These need to be arm's length people. They understand your work. They uh, know your work well enough to talk about it, but they've never worked with you. So you can imagine that's a tricky subset to define. Um, they need to comment on what you've been able to do, what's great about you, your likelihood of continued success. And then because there's this multi-level review and it's moving further and further away from your field, there's three components to the letter. There's the content, what they said about you and your work. That has to be clear to readers in your own field and also to the president of your university. The letter writer is usually recognized most at those closest levels. Oh, that's a famous statistician. Oh, that's a famous data scientist. Um, the name recognition may not carry further out. Um, and then the letterhead matters at the higher levels. Is it coming from what's called a peer institution, whether that's some uh, institution you think is like yours or one you want to be like? So you'll need people who write well, can identify your unique strengths and put them in context. They have to come from institutions that your higher administration feels like are competitors for hiring you, say. Uh, and they need to provide some insightful comments summarizing your accomplishments. Uh, your chair and your dean will typically try to pull quotes out of these or summarize the main points made by the letter writers. Now, we've already talked about the out-of-the-box nature of data science. Um, the challenge is how do you package things that aren't in the typical mode of uh, hard copy peer-reviewed paper so that people inside your field recognize it as a success and people outside the box also say, oh, you're really good at data science. 
Now, this is something that's important for you to talk about with your chair and your mentors, mentors at your department, people whose work you respect at other places, colleagues you have. And you should also discuss this in particular with whoever the representative from your department is on the promotion committee and say, these are the kind of things I'm doing. Here's why they're important for data science. Have them meet some of your colleagues at other places. Let them see um, examples of success in this area because they're an advocate for you. Now, the basic re evidence of research success are peer-reviewed, citable, and cited publications. Other people, you're able to get peer review. Uh, they recognize your work as high quality. It gets published, and other people are using it, and they're citing it as because you did this work, I can do this work. Authorship, the order of the authors matters, although that varies by field. Some large labs, lab sciences will have the last author is the senior author. They're the person with the grant. The first author is the person who's typically did a lot of work. Um, some fields have a tradition of using alphabetical lists. Um, I, I generally don't collaborate in those areas because my last name starts with a W, but um, you know that's, that's if your name starts with A, that might be a good thing. Um, journal quality does matter. Having a lot of publications in, in journals without a good reputation doesn't really help you as much as a few high quality publications. Now quality there can be discipline specific. So what about blogs? What about simply stats, say? What about Andrew Gelman's blog? There's some really influential people posting and ideas there that people quote from. They end up in media reports. Uh, they get passed on. Um, they get reblogged. Uh, what about social media? There's some really you know, wonderful tr Twitter feeds to follow. The key question is, are you having an impact, and can you document that you're having an impact? Are people talking about your work, can you show that it's showing up in places? Will the letter writers, the people who are evaluating you for tenure, be able to notice this and comment on it in their letter? Having somebody uh, who's a full professor somewhere say, I follow this blog myself, they've given me great ideas, that would be fantastic. Saying I have a blog, the, if the committee members aren't familiar with it, they don't quite know what to do with it. Now this is something that's still evolving because some things are peer reviewed, the nature of peer review changes. Now the data science piece, we talked about this you know, number kicked around, Duncan Temple Lang talks that 80% you know, of the time is getting the data in use to do something else. How do you document that effort? Um, the outcome of that is scholarly output, it's research output, it's a great use of your time. So how do you show that your scholarly output is involved when the product is a data a, a, a complex data set that others can use, or software. Um, review committees typically recognize, re they know what to do with peer-reviewed publications. There's some variations I said before, like in computer science, as uh, Chris was mentioning, conference, peer-reviewed conference papers are just the norm. That's the standard. If you go to the big conferences and you, you're getting things published, that's, that's where you show success. In statistics, we think conference papers. Who does conference papers? This is all about peer-reviewed journals. And then my um, basic science, biology, ecology colleagues will go, journals, statistics journals, I saw the impact factor on that. That's nothing like what we compare it to ours. Um, you know, and to the point where I've heard anecdotally of people with laminated cards in their wallet sorting um, journal titles by impact factor on which ones to submit to. Um, regardless of those tweaks, peer review publication are kind of the coin of the realm for the review um, committees, especially if they've been in academia for a long time. Now, when they see a list of software, they see data sets listed in a CV, do they know what to do? Uh, sometimes people will list their software and say it's been downloaded 14,000 times. Um, if the parallel to journal publications, I think Jeff made this to the chairs group, downloads would be the same as how many people read your paper or meant to read it. They downloaded the PDF and then never read it. Um, citations really are a better measure of people who used it were influenced by your work and, and are passing it on. So citation would be a better thing to do, but it's not consistently done. Um, we need to represent your scholarly productivity in a way that's familiar to the reviewers. And here's, this isn't really a hack, but a way, if you're going up for promotion now, how do you present this if, if the community's not citing things? Um, I think it's important to link your software and data if they were motivated and and by a paper you did, or you published some papers that included your software, or it came from that, you know, add a note after the, after the publication list and say, related software developed for this, and you can put download and citation statistics there if you have them. Um, you could mention your contribution to data development. Perhaps you had a, a um, 
you were part of a research team that you had to spend months putting this data set together and it's now it's publicly available and you want to get uh, credit for it but this publication came out you can list your you were largely responsible for that and list it so that it's linked to that um, peer-reviewed publication. I'm not saying this is the solution to this the problem but it is a way to kind of frame your data and software developments uh, in the current context um, among your peer review publications. Now the third bullet listing a separate section say software and data this is a great place to do it but the committees I think often look at that and my experience with promotion committees is they tend to look at that and they weight it slightly less. Um, you know it's important to document this however you can um, but I think having a separate section it often gets overlooked if they think oh I'm done with peer review oh there's a software list it's hard to see how it's connected or they have a hard time seeing it. Other recent developments are um, there are journals that publish software like the Journal of Statistical Software. Um, the, the software works and people are using it. Is it worth your effort time? Do I have to write a paper for it? Well, um, you need, this is where information from your promotion committee can help out. If they tend to dismiss software listed, then it might be worth writing this paper about it. Um, does GitHub count as a publication? Do downloads the same as citation? Sci software is dynamic, but in, in all of our work for reproducible research, we need citable versions of the software. So this is, we want to get towards citation, but it's a moving target. Um, just January of last year, NSF had a workshop supporting the scientific discovery through norms and practices for software, data science, and attribution. There's a lot of great talks archived here. Um, I didn't go to this meeting. I was not aware of it until I was preparing for JSM. But I read a lot of the material there. One of the top three action items was for the research community to come together to come up with consistent data and software citation formats. And a lot of different disciplines, American Geophysical, uh, union and some others I'll mention in a minute are coming up with different criteria, but um, uh, it's still kind of all over the place. Um, some more promising things in July of this year, in collaboration with GitHub, Elsevier announced a new academic content class for publication called Original Software Publications. Um, all software and code published is and will remain fully owned by the developers as long as it's uh, open source. Um, this is a good thing because it provides a DOI for the uh, software. And then if we think similarly for data as a publication, since most federally funded research grants require public data dissemination, you know, what does public dis data dissemination mean? Is it on your lab website? Um, you know, that's probably not the, the most permanent place to put it. Uh, now, GenBank's been around for a long time. Um, and that gets cited, but I still feel it's not that consistent um, uh, for every paper. You might put the details of all the work you put into the data uh, munging in the supplemental materials, but that, that sort of seems like a waste. You're not really getting credit for it. Um, so this is also evolving rapidly. I mentioned GenBack's been around for a long time. The datasite.org uh, is uh, coming up with ways to, to post your data so that it's citable. Um, the Research Data Alliance has a data citation working group. They talk about some of their ideas. The American Geophysical Union has had several presentations at their recent meetings on this. And there's a joint declaration of data science principles from 2014. I will show that. I'm not aware of, but maybe missing some activities by American Statistical Association, IMS, um, International Biometric Society. But um, I don't know that our professional organizations are as engaged as some of the others. <clears throat> the joint, joint declaration lists, now we probably could have come up with a list of seven things like this, but it gives you a sense of, of this. One is recognizing the importance of your data and that it should be something that's citable to point to a particular version at a particular date. Two, it needs to um, give evidence that someone has used your data set. And it looks like I spelled principles wrong, but... Um, Number three, unique identification, and uh, I just became aware of these this last week on Wednesday. The National Cancer Institute sponsored a webinar on web citation, and this uh, was pointed out that even the site at the bottom here says citing the data science data citation synthesis group, and then it gives a URL rather than something like a, a DOI for persistence on number five, so it doesn't follow its own rules. Um, it needs to be, have a unique identifier. It needs to be accessible. Uh, local websites might go up or down. It must be persistent, um, where that's where I think URLs fall apart. 
It must be specific to that data set, and you must be able to verify that you've got the same version for that name as anybody else, and it must provide some interoperability and flexibility. Um, uh, the this, this speaker at NCI's webinar, uh, there was some discussion about, you know, the H index. I don't particularly care for it myself, but it is something that can be calculated by Web of Science. If we were consistently citing data sets like we do publications, we could come up with indices and measures and analytics on how often your data are used. Um, also, there's been a growth of publishing data sets and providing DOIs for the data sets themselves, not just the generating paper. Dryad is one that goes along with, like, the PLOS journals. Uh, typically, in Dryad, you're posting an abstract, some readme description, and the data in a zip file. Um, a step further than that, Nature Publishing Group started about two years ago an online open access journal called Scientific Data, uh, and you can, you can write data descriptors, which are peer-reviewed papers describing the details that went into creating the data set. Um, shortly after Jeff asked if I would be part of the JSM session, Scientific Data wrote and asked if I'd be on the editorial board, and I decided to do it just to see what this was like. So I've seen a wide variety of, um, due to my interest in spatial statistics, mostly GIS-type complicated data sets. But this is all the data that I appreciate having in its own publication rather than buried in um, supplemental material. Um, so there'll be like the science or nature paper, but there can be a scientific data paper that describes how they, they put all of the information together. It's peer-reviewed, some are accepted, some aren't. Uh, it gives a narrative and a link to the data, data set. There's a DOI for the descriptor and the data set. And so the citation protocol along these lines is cite the original paper and then cite the data if you're analyzing the data. A dryad citation typically has two things. When using this data, they cite the original publication. For instance, here's a PLOS One article. And additionally, cite the data package. And there's an example of the DOI for the data package. For scientific data, there'll be a scientific data citation of the um, data descriptor, so the first one here is an example, uh, followed by author contributions, which would be searchable. The data citation itself appears with a separate DOI again. These are in addition to the motivating article. Now, it's not just to bump your numbers up of three publications instead of one, but it's to publish the pieces that can be cited for what they contained. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on teaching data science because that'll be our next presentation, but in terms of showing that you are contributing and how to put this in your promotion package, uh, you need to think, who are you training? What do they want to know? What do they need to know? How do they want to learn it? And this may not be in a traditional curriculum. Uh, it may be through different modalities. Um, National Research Council and the Committee on Applied and Theoretical Statistics recently had a workshop, and there's a nice little booklet available online as well on t training students to extract value from big data. Uh, they were interviewed or had participants from industry and um, from academia talking about uh, what do data science jobs require and where do we teach it. Similar, a lot of the points raised by Chris are outlined here too. Um, MastersinDataScience.org lists a lot of master's programs in data science and lists basic skills. Um, it talks about new courses in the traditional format like you would get in a master's degree or something. That's good because for promotion, because traditional academics know what to do with this, the challenge is this isn't necessarily the most popular approach with either the instructors or the trainees. So as Jeff and Roger and others at Hopkins have shown, their Coursera program is wildly successful. Um, there's a lot written about MOOCs. There's strong opinions among academics. Um, It'd be good to know if someone reviewing you really doesn't like them, if that's what you're getting into, but um, or that they're very positive. There are a lot of boot camp training, short-term coding principles. Alyssa mentioned some of these herself. Um, if you participate in these, you want to be able to document that as some of your teaching contribution. And then there's the kind of one-day things like hackathons, or if you don't like calling them hackathons, you can call them analytic challenges. Um, Sometimes these are sort of pre-internships just to see who's willing to code for 24 hours on, on snacks, um, but uh, others. In terms of instructional value, some of the question is the long-term impact of these, and the really key is trying to document this. Similarly with YouTube tutorials for coding, there's some wonderful channels that are making a huge difference, but again, how do you show 
uh, the difference you're making. So the constant challenge for all of these is documentation. How many people sign up for your class? How many are participating? How many complete? It's very similar to the downloads versus citation issue. There's a lot of analytics for online courses in particular, which are compelling and are they compelling to the people who be reviewing? Um, can letter writers comment on this? This person does a great boot camp. Um, you know, having specifics on that can be really helpful. And be aware of and preempt any preconceptions the voting faculty may have. If someone really doesn't like boot camp ideas and you, that's all you do, you can expect that they're not going to be too happy with it. Um, so you may spend some time talking them up on the advantages in your experiences, both in your department, at your level, above you, and the higher administrators in your school or department. So to wrap it all up, general principles of putting together a packet, have an informative personal statement, highlight your accomplishments, tell them what's different about you, and define these as strengths. Establish your goals and show that you're headed towards them. Think about uh, who to recommend to write letters for you, what those letters should contain, um, you know, what do you want them specifically to talk about in addition to the standard teaching research and service, and frame your comp Frame your accomplishments as evidence of success. Figure out how to document this and show that your novel elements that aren't traditional are extensions of the standards of success. This is again where this scholarship reconsidered wider view of scholarship helps. And then link it all together. Your chair is going to be presenting this and have to give a summary of it. You want them to be able to have a compelling story. So the key ideas from today are know the rules, know how the process works. I've given a cartoon picture of it. Know what counts as evidence and who counts it that way. Recognize what you're doing and what counts as success. What are you producing? Provide a context for evaluating your accomplishments. Uh, think about citations. Having a DOI as your friend, whether it's for data or software or papers. Discuss with your chair early and often. Discuss with other faculty members and mentors early and often. And just kind of don't obsess about getting promoted. Just do what you do well. And make sure when someone asks, what are you doing, you know what to say. And I'll end there. OK, great. Thanks very much, Lance. I really appreciate it. Uh, that was a really nice talk. And I'm going to, I took all the notes. So that was very helpful. Um, so our last talk, we're going to hand it over to uh, Jenny Bryan uh, from UBC. And she's going to be talking about um, teaching data, data science. And they will come. And so I'll hand it over to Jenny now. OK, so hopefully you can hear me. So the first thing I'd like to do is thank Jeff again for convening our session and the ASA for uh, giving us this chance to give it again. So let me try to share my screen. Hold on. All right, hopefully this is working. Looks good. Am I on? Yeah? Yeah, we can see it. OK, so uh, I guess this is a sidebar that uh, a bunch of us printed our own ribbons for JSM. So one of my biggest recommendations is if you want to meet a lot of people at a conference, you should do this, because people come up and talk to you constantly. Um, and one of them, I actually conferred upon myself the title of data science. So. You can trust everything I have to say here. And I made a landing page for this uh, on GitHub. I think I've tweeted this, that you could be, find my slides, and then I've updated it since this screenshot was taken. It has links to everybody else's slides as well. Um, so the topic uh, I wanted to cover here is that there's this like increasing need for us to train both our students and the students who come from other departments to effectively process data. And there's so many students that I come into contact with who have a big, hairy data set sitting between them and their academic goal. And there's very little in their formal training that's really prepared them for this. And so uh, I'm very interested in my own teaching um, to create more opportunities for this. So, Everything I'm talking about has been informed by doing a lot of data science -y teaching over the past several years. So the course I think I'm most talking about is um, a graduate course I teach at UBC in the stat department called STAT 545, which is our, just like our main data analysis or exploratory data analysis course. And 
I've owned it since 2008 at least. That's as far back as this computer goes. And uh, I've had sort of similar experiences in teaching uh, stats for genomics, which is STAT 540. But that's been done with various colleagues over the years, so that's been a really great team experience. And then outside of UBC, I have done work with software carpentry and data carpentry and a group of people trying to create a curriculum for reproducible science. And so that sort of stuff tends to go down in weekend workshops and whatnot, but it's, it's quite related. Um, so this is a slide I've shown forever in STAT 545 on the first day where I'm trying to help students understand what my point is. And I feel like in almost every other course in our department, we're, we're really pumping them full of theory and methods. And uh, what I found when I graduated <laughs> was that, that did not really prepare me to bring all of those methods to bear on real-world data sets. And so I think of this course as really trying to build a bridge between those two things. And for better or worse, I don't really increase people's knowledge of statistical theory. I feel like they've got to go to those other courses for that. But I'm more interested in making sure whatever statistics they understand, they're absolutely ready to apply to real-world data. And so here's the website for the course if you'd like to go look at it further. I think it's probably pretty Googleable as well. Um, this shows you a little bit about the increasing interest in data science. So I've had my enrollment go up by quite a bit, and then particularly you'll see it's the people from outside of statistics who are increasingly interested in putting themselves through a miserable six or 12 weeks um, to get better at working with data. Yes, I have a pie chart in this talk because I think they're okay if they're binary. But the main point I wanted to show with this is, again, that like, I'm mostly not teaching statisticians and that we've got people coming from you know, 54 different departments so far since I've been keeping track of this. So there's a great deal of interest across the campus for this. And so I think stat departments who can find a way to teach this to their own students and others um, can also really sort of make themselves indispensable. Um, and so I think that's a point I want to make here. And I think there's a lot of statistics faculty that thinks this is still up for negotiation, who's going to teach data science, and they don't quite realize the extent to which um, this train has arguably already left the station. So here's you know, one version and one person's definition of data science degrees where the claim is there's you know, over 300 programs already, 180 of which are in the US. I don't think those are all necessarily master's programs, but some sort of data science degree. Um, and another type of training program is these boot camps that help usually a, a scientific PhD retool themselves through a sort of six to 12 week immersive experience and hopefully um, become employable in a data science industry job. And finally, I wanted to say a little bit about the Johns Hopkins program because Jeff and Roger <laughs> didn't put themselves in as speakers, and I'm not sure, again, that everyone appreciates the scope of what they're doing with their data science Coursera program. So I actually have a few slides from Roger. But So they've got a nine-course sequence, um, each of which runs for four weeks, and they're running pretty much constantly, as far as I can tell. And it's a fairly low-cost thing. And they have a tremendous number of people who are interested in doing this. So at any given moment, there might be hundreds of thousands of people involved. Of course, there's a much lower completion rate. But when you look at it, that they've had, I'm sure this number is bigger now, you know, well over 1,000 people actually complete the data science specialization. And then if I think of how many people in my own department is graduating in statistics, um, and, and then the even smaller group of people I'm training in my own course, um, I, I think it helps people get a sense of there are very big movements afoot and things are already very, very much underway and it's definitely sort of past time for staff departments to figure out how they want to fit in here. Um, these are four of many possible great links, but if you want to read more or watch another talk, about 
soul searching in statistics and where we fit in and where statistics fit in, these are four really nice ones. Um, the one at the very top is the one I'm going to highlight. And it actually was added since I gave this talk in August. Um, so David Donahoe gave the keynote talk at the Tukey Centennial uh, celebration in the middle of September and luckily published a manuscript, uh, I think it's like a companion to the talk, and he did this just beautiful job of going through, you know, semi-recent statistical history and showing how a lot of our luminaries have been kind of preaching this data science gospel for a while and we haven't necessarily been listening. So, of course, he started with Tukey and a quote from 1962 that probably a lot of people have seen, uh, where Tukey confessed, I think it's in the annals of statistics, that the more he sort of watched what's going on in math stat, um, he began to come to the realization that his central interest was in data analysis itself, and then, of course, he amplifies exactly what he means by that. Um, moving on, uh, Donahoe also highlights some quotes from John Chambers from 1993, who I think has pretty prescient <laughs> comments for today, which is that we have a choice about continuing to focus on our traditional topics, especially mathematical stat, or building a bigger tent that's much more inclusive about all the different things that it takes to learn from data, and that if we take this latter course, which I think we are seriously considering now, whether whether it's by choice or by force, um, you know, it's challenging but exciting. Whereas if we stick with the former, we're at real risk um, of being kind of passed by, which is a, a running theme in these um, talks and papers about where does statistics fit in. Um, then, also from the Donahoe paper, there was um, information from Cleveland, who actually went so far as to suggest how a statistics department should allocate its effort. Uh, and I found this really fascinating. Uh, so 20% to theory, which Donahoe thinks most departments are closer to 100, or so, you know, at least a while ago they certainly were. And then he has all these other areas where um, they're advocating more and more effort. And it just seems like we're really far from this. And I think it's a very interesting perspective. And so at the end of his historical review, Donahoe proposes uh, a term called greater data science with these six you know, pillars or major components of work and explicitly says if we, if we were really going to embrace the full scope of what he calls greater data science, we have to really change what we're teaching and how we teach it. And so I wouldn't say that my course fills all of these gaps, but I found reading this paper incredibly satisfying because I feel like it gives me you know, motivation and to a certain extent cover for uh, why I choose the topics I choose. So uh, this is you know, a theme I think has been in everyone's talk, but we all hear these people who say that data science is just statistics, and then every now and then that same person will say something like data wrangling is not statistics, or pick one of the many other topics you could put there. And I just really take issue with this, because um, I think if you value being a self-consistent person, there's just no way to defend holding those two positions and I'm, I'm hoping that the way the wind is blowing is that we do build this sort of bigger definition of statistics. Um, this is a slide I borrowed from a Hadley Wickham talk, I think in another Simply Statistics Unconference, that's a nice graphical overview of, of what data analysis tends to look like. And that again, we can't focus all of our training on the modeling part and leave students to their own devices to figure out how to do these other things. And in particular, data preparation is the part that I have found brings my students uh, very, very quickly to their knees. Um, so I'm not actually doing this anymore, but for several years the course would end with a, a project and I would ambitiously encourage the students to you know, pick a real data set and get data from the wild. <laughs> and 
this did not always go so well. <laughs> and I often the students who picked like the coolest data sets and the most interesting problems would turn in a project that consisted of like partially cleaned data. And that was as far as they'd gotten. And so this is an incomplete list of all the ways these projects would go sideways and people would simply run out of time. And like they never even got to do the statistics that they know how to do because just out of the starting gate they would meet these huge obstacles. And so I thought about, well, where in my course did I actually teach them how to do any of that? And then if I was super honest with myself, I had to confess, I taught them none of it. And then I thought about, am I even capable of teaching it? And then I thought, no, I'm not. <laughs> so I've had to be willing to learn a lot of stuff and to be willing to learn it in public and to teach it even though I'm not exactly uh, perfect at it yet. <laughs> Which also brings me to, uh, I just want to put in a plug for the most excellent TAs that I've had in the recent past and so last year and this year in particular where I'm basically able I think to offer a much better course because I'm willing to take advantage of the expertise out there in the existing grad student population where they often know things that a stat professor doesn't um, and can be brought in to really revitalize certain topics. So the way this course is now is instead of permitting people, I actually just view it as like a boot camp and it's a requirement that they have to get their computer set up for data analysis and to do certain types of tasks over and over and over and over again for three months and become proficient at it. So it's a lot of descriptive statistics, exploration and visualization. We have a lot of emphasis on bringing data in from the wild. So we're not going to look at UCI machine learning data sets. Like it has to actually be real data, trying to get them ready to practice open science and to automate things. Everyone builds one R package. Everyone builds one shiny app. All the homework has to be submitted basically as a web page in some sense. And so I feel like I've made them at least walk through some of these canonical tasks. And it doesn't mean that we're all total pros at this stuff, but at least it's been demystified and they've done it once. And this is what the structure of the course actually looks like. We spend quite a bit of time at the beginning getting everyone competent with R Markdown, which is how they actually do most of their homework and with Git and GitHub, and I've just decided that you actually need to devote plenty of time to that, and then you can take advantage of it for the rest of the course. And so it actually, um, the pain associated to that fades very, very quickly, and we can focus on getting them very good at R and moving into these other topics. Um, so that's basically the end. I'm going to put out just a few more provocative statements in case it causes people to ask interesting questions or conversations we can have in the future in person, come find me. Um, so I wanted to say one thing about like MOOCs. So clearly that Johns Hopkins program is incredibly successful and I certainly see the success in like software and data carpentry. But I also have mixed feelings about this because I've actually had those things sort of thrown back at me from, from higher ups that this stuff is getting covered in MOOCs and weekend boot camps. And I do kind of want to push back against that to a certain extent because it feels like we're just kicking the can down the road in terms of figuring out how this is all going to fit into our regular programs and our regular workload and our regular career rewards. So I think that's an interesting thing for us to think about. Um, yeah, this is another quote about I think people who don't do a lot of data analysis and data cleaning and tool building and figuring out how to fit different tools into a workflow, I think it's quite easy to think this is easier than it is um, and that it has less intellectual content than it actually does. So again, I'd like to invite people to try doing more of this themselves and I think you'll find there's more to it and there's more statistical thinking than one thinks. And lastly, yeah, I just wanted to bring up this topic again of, I think a lot of times people think of statistical computing and data analysis and all they see are the tools and the programming that's behind the tools. And I think it's really important to realize how much thought has to go into 
abstractions and models for approaching you know, like natural problems in data analysis before you can ever sit down and write those tools. So to go back to that Donahoe paper, I mean, my talk's mostly about teaching, but he also gets into what data science research would be, and he really emphasizes that you can look at some of our modern tools, like um, the Tidy R package in that paper from Hadley Wickham, or Yi Hui Ji's um, Knitter package as, yes, of course, it's a tool, but there's also a great deal of thought uh, that goes into what are the right abstractions that then cause you to build that tool as a solution. So I think that's it. I'll wrap it up and hand it back over to Jeff. Great. Jenny, thanks very much. Uh, that was a really nice talk, and I'm very excited about all the talks. I think they went really well. Um, I think we have time for one question for each speaker, and we're going to just uh, I'll, we'll funnel them uh, through the speakers here ourselves. And so the first question um, I'm actually going to ask is for Alyssa. And so uh, for those of you that don't know, Alyssa was a student of mine. I went to school here at Hopkins. But I'm going to ask her to uh, pick on us a little bit and say, is there anything you wish that you had learned in graduate school that we could do better as, a, as you know, in training people to be ready for like that onslaught of crazy tasks that you had listed uh, in your month at Stripe? So I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Sure. Um... Well, my main thought is that I was able to get this job out of grad school, and I have been doing the job. Uh, so part of the important thing that I think you guys did a good job about was teaching you how to figure out things that you don't know how to do. Or like saying, you know, I, I need you to do this project. We need a solution. Have fun. I don't know how to do that, and you might need to use a new tool. Like that thing translates really well into like going into a company where you might not know the tech stack. Um, so I think that is where like a applied stat grad program will do you well. It will teach you how to use things that maybe you don't know how to use. Um, but then in terms, mostly what I felt is like the technical side of things was a little harder. Like I had never written SQL queries before I started my job because. We tend to not. We tend to have data stored in like text files and fastq files, and you know, huge CSVs and stuff like that, which doesn't require you to like understand the like select group by sort of mentality. Although maybe this is getting easier with like the new uh, like dplyr r packages and stuff. Um, so like understanding like the notion of databases and how you would like think about them, that was something I wish I knew more about, as well as like how pieces of a software application work together. So that's been like hard for me is like, here's a code base. You understand like the individual files in it, but like where is this thing coming from in the in like how all of the pieces work together? And I think that's just part of like working more with software and, and figuring out how that goes. Um, yeah, that's what I have. Okay, cool. I think that's a pretty good answer. But mostly okay. it was great. Mostly it was great. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so um, I'm actually going to uh, exercise my chair's prerogative here and actually ask Chris a question as well, which is he mentioned that, you know, he sees, you, you see, Chris, you mentioned you see computer science students and stat students, and the stat students often focus on one or two projects, um, and then they kind of try to hit, hit it with a hammer when they show up. Do you have any sort of suggestions? You know, some of that they can learn from their program, but do you have any suggestions of things students could do, like, on their own initiative to kind of get prepared for that sort of thing when they show up for an interview in, at yeah. or somewhere else like that? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, uh, you know, from my experience, um, you know, the internship was invaluable to have that experience to be able to see both real-world problems and to see how other people approach real-world problems in a, in, a, in a setting. And so I think nowadays there's a lot of internships available for statisticians, and I think that um, that's I would recommend everyone to do one or two internships during their time in grad school if they're advisor willing, of course. Um, you know, there's other opportunities out there. I mean, I think you know, go out and grab data and start analyzing it. And read blogs and go to Simply Stats and um, <laughs> you know, do a Kaggle competition. So for those of you who don't know, Kaggle is a website that has data competitions. You can download data and try and answer questions, and you may or may not win. But you know, if you join the forums and you hear about how other people are are um, appro approaching problems, then you can go learn about it. You know, if people are using some new technique that you've never heard of, go ahead and research it. It might take some effort on the students' part to go and do it themselves because if they're not getting it in their curriculum. But you know, these days there's a lot of resources out there for people to go and and find out what's out there and use new techniques and learn about them and start implementing them. 
Cool, thanks. And for those of you that don't know, Chris is actually one of the original Netflix Prize winners and so has a little experience with winning these contests. Uh, and some other time we'll have to have him on to tell us all about the drama around that. Um, he actually had a question for uh, Jenny, I think, that I was going to turn it over to him next sure. week. You can ask Jenny. Um, yeah, Jenny, you know, I, I think your course in some, in some senses is on the cutting edge. You know, I think it's a good exemplar for what other people can be doing. And I wonder what your philosophy is about um, incorporating new technologies. So, um, you know, there's always new things coming out. You know, Hadley comes out with a package, and, you know, in two years everyone's using it, and it's the status quo. Um, you know, but you probably have to decide as you're putting the course together what to include and what not to include. How do you how do you make that balance between incorporating new things but not you know chasing the latest fad? Yeah, I think mostly I've made the course out of things that I wish I knew or that I feel like I spend a lot of time doing and no one actually taught me. So that's usually my first judgment call. And then, I mean, I haven't hesitated to put new R stuff in. But I've probably been quite slow to put new non-R stuff in. For example, to get to Alyssa's point, I think a gaping hole is databases, for example. <laughs> and then the kind of thing that's certainly not there but I still have mixed feelings about is maybe you know, cloud computing and these sorts of things. But um, there's actually a great, I think it's a Larry Wasserman quote, that you can't do brain surgery until you know how to put on a Band-Aid. And so I think of this course as probably more the like band-aid application to prepare people to learn how to do brain surgery because really a lot of them are starting as like basically Excel users. Um, so I guess that's how I think of it. Okay, that's great. Um, I mean, that quote is amazing. The band-aid uh, is an amazing quote. I want to use that a lot. Uh, actually, I think Jenny had a question now for uh, Lance, and so I was going to let her uh, lead, lead with that question. I do. So, Lance, I'm mercifully through the tenure process, but now people are bugging me about eventually I would have to go up for full professor, and I am a square peg in a round hole, and I present all sorts of vexing issues. But so one thing we're doing is really carefully reading our faculty agreement. And there's this notion of there's scholarly activity and also what's called professional activity. And it's possible that maybe a lot of the things I do are easy, more easily described as professional activity. And I'm wondering, is that unique to my university? Or do you see other universities where there's probably more in the faculty agreement than people are used to reading and looking at? And that there's sort of novel approaches to promoting people who do unconventional things? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, our, our promotion guidelines, I know they talk about, so there's teaching, research, and service. You have to be excellent in one and very good in the others. It used to say adequate, and they said, yeah. um, but excellence in research is sort of the, the usual one, so everyone's used to looking at that. Excellence in teaching, they came up with very strict, you know, strict criteria for that. But excellence in service, you know, no, nobody knows what to do with that. I don't know of anyone who's done it. I think in your case, you're talking about stuff that's in on a borderline. Um, I don't think you view it as professional service, but somebody outside says, if that's not writing a statistics paper, then it must be professional service. So um, part of it's building up uh, a, a group of contemporaries and mentors who appreciate what it is, who can write a letter, you know, for you, and, you know, maybe, you know, trying to find people who can recognize and, and verbalize that contribution, and sometimes they would be people in your own field, sometimes it's these people who are really into Boyer Scholarship Reconsidered, for instance, um, because they recognize, and, and you, you may find a a history professor at your in your university or something who you know really writes about this a lot or or something. There there are a lot of um, academics, and not necessarily you know they look like statisticians, but who really espouse this and will be strong advocates. Um, they're they're not always on the promotion committee. I mean you're you're ta you are trying to convince a group of people, some of whom. Have, can have very narrow views. So the documentation piece is kind of key. If someone can describe what you're doing and while um, if somebody only did a little bit of this you might consider it professional service but you're doing it at a much higher level um, 
and you know you've you've contributed to it in a way that changes the way other people do things. That's to me that's difference. The difference between research and service. If I've done something in a way that makes somebody else change how they do it, I just didn't help them do what they asked me to, what they wanted to do in the first place. Because I, I could switch out. Um, I could get any qualified person to help them finish their project. But if you're the kind of person who can make their project better, and I can't just replace you with somebody else with the same result, then I think that's, that's my benchmark for you know, this being a contribution. Great, thanks a lot. I have a bunch of other questions that I'm going to ask you later, Lance, so you can get ready. I'll take a bunch of notes. But um, I think I'm going to uh, take a minute here and, and uh, wrap up. So we really appreciate you turning out for the Simply Statistics ASA uh, webinar here on the identity crisis. Hopefully we've totally resolved all of your identity crises and everything's okay now. Uh, and so actually I'm going to turn it over to Rick to uh, take us out. And uh, thank you very much, and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. Uh, thank you, Jeff, and thanks to everybody for presenting today. We really appreciate you taking the time off to do this. Uh, what a great way to end the work week. Uh, it was a great presentation. Everyone out there, thank you for attending, too. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, this is kind of a pilot program for ASA. We hope to do more of these, and, of course, uh, we'll work out any technical bugs for the next time, but uh, it should be good. Uh, so, anyway, I think we'll shut down for now, and everyone have a great day and a great weekend. Bye.